This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to UCTV and a presentation of What a Pain, Considerations for Effectively Managing Pain in Later Years. My name is Tim Cutler and I'm a professor of clinical pharmacy at the UC San Francisco School of Pharmacy. Today our objectives are the following. We're going to first describe the different types of pain, discuss first-line pain treatments for mild to moderate pain, and discuss the use of opioids and the treatment of chronic pain safely. This talk is intended to be an introductory conversation about pain in older adults. If you want more detailed information, there are some references at the end of the slide deck that you can refer to for more information. Let's start with the case. TC is a 72-year-old male with a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, mild heart failure, and high cholesterol. He's noticed that his knees are stiff in the morning and he'd like to take something to get going. What options are available for TC in this situation? I'm sure many of you may be in the same situation as TC, wondering what is the best option to help treat my mild to moderate pain? First of all, let's talk a bit more about pain. And when I say pain is a pain, I mean it's difficult, it's uncomfortable, uh, it's painful, let's be honest, and it affects our lives. What's interesting is that 50% of community dwelling adults over the age of 65 experience pain in the last 30 days, but most do not report it. 80% of nursing home residents experience pain, and as I mentioned, it's very underreported in both populations. Pain is not always assessed when you go see your provider. You're not always asked, what kind of pain are you having? And you should not have to live in that type of pain. Let's talk a bit about why pain is often undertreated or underreported. First of all, there's not a great screening tool for pain. We'll talk about a couple examples in a few slides that show how we can assess pain, but they have their own limitations. There's a belief that we all hold that pain is sort of a normal part of aging, when in fact it is not. It's always a consequence of other complications. There's also a concern about addiction to pain medications, and there's a reluctance to prescribe pain medications from providers. Again, as we move forward in this discussion, we'll talk more about those issues. So let's first categorize the two types of pain that are commonly experienced by individuals. The first is somatic pain. That's the most commonly described as a muscle or joint injury. It's sort of a dull, aching pain. And it's generally treated by interrupting the pain-producing pathway or acting on the natural pain reduction receptors that we have in our bodies. The second type of pain is neuropathic. So there may be an injury in the past, and as a result of that injury in the past, there may be some nerve firing, uh, even after that injury is healed, that's inappropriate, that's telling your body, I'm in pain, when in fact there is no more injury in existence. Also could be inappropriate nerve firing, indicate, indicating that there's pain in a non-injury related area. And the, an example of this might be diabetic neuropathy, where uh, blood sugars that have been high for a long time have damaged nerves, and as a result, the nerves are firing, saying, I'm, I'm in pain, but in fact, there is no pain, or, or there is pain, but rather there's no injury at the site. And this type of pain is usually described as tingling, zapping, electrical type pain. And in this situation, we really treat that uh, pain differently. We try and modify that nerve signal. The purpose of this talk is not uh, to talk about neuropathic pain. We're gonna focus today instead on the somatic pain, which is the most common type of pain that older adults will experience. So why is it important to treat pain? What is the reason that, that we're having this discussion today? Undertreated pain can lead to many other complications, and these include depression, anxiety, even risk of falls, slower rehabilitation after an injury, sleep disturbances. So please do not believe the myth that it's a normal part of aging and it won't affect you. It is absolutely not a normal part of aging. It is not, a, it is not typical, it is not what you would expect. And it's a consequence of other related things and an undertreated pain really is a pain and actually can lead to many complications. 
So we talked a bit about how do you assess pain. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, there are not um, really outstanding um, tools that we have. They all have their limitations, but we have a couple of, of good ways to assess uh, different types of, of pain and, and qualities of pain. But the most important way to sort of make sure that your pain is treated effectively is to express to your provider that you are experiencing pain. So self-report is by far the best way to assure you are heard. Now in some situations, it's very difficult to express that type of pain. For example, if you're um, you know, unable to speak for some reason or there's, uh, there's other nonverbal cues that we can use for uh, individuals who may have cognitive impairment or difficulty speaking, um, but it is important to recognize the signs, you know, the wincing, the, the moaning, the other sort of um, non-conversational signs that individuals are in pain. When you're talking about expressing pain, it's really important to describe the type of pain. Is it dull, aching, shooting, electric? And then describe the intensity of pain. And again, I'll mention in a slide or two here some of the assessment tools that we use to determine how intense is that pain. And then the quality of pain is also important to uh, describe to your provider. When does it hurt? When does it not hurt? How often does it hurt? What kind of activities are you limited uh, in, in participating with because you are in a, in a very painful uh, position? So the first and most common assessment tool that we use is the numeric scale. So this is the question that many of you are familiar with that sometimes providers will ask if you're having a pain episode, and that is from zero to 10, please describe your pain. Zero being no pain and 10 being the worst possible pain you could experience. Now let me stop here for a minute and just mention that pain is subjective. That is partly um, sort of the complication with pain. We don't have a very objective way to measure it. I can't um, run a test and say, well, your pain scale is six, and run a test on somebody else and say their pain scale is six. Your pain scale of six is gonna be very, very different than someone else's pain scale of six. But the point being, it's always the same tool that we use. So if you have the same scale within yourself, then we're looking at apples to apples comparisons of a subjective measure. If people are unable to communicate, especially this is true for children or older adults who may have some cognitive impairment or inability to speak related to other complications, we can use a visual descriptor scale. This is an example of a visual, visual descriptor scale where on the far left we have zero or no pain and on the far right we have 10 which you can see is a very unhappy crying face. So it goes from I'm fine, happy to I'm very upset, this pain is, is very intolerable. So back to TC, he's in pain now. So what are we going to do to help him out? Well, he now knows that pain is not a normal part of aging. Pain should be expressed to his provider, his doctor. He can use a scale to describe the pain intensity, and he should use descri uh, descriptors rather to describe the quality of that pain and the intensity and the duration and, and what types of activities are, are, is he limited by. So now he knows, okay, I'm in pain, this is not normal, this is something I should probably have evaluated, and he's going to make an appointment with his doctor. But unfortunately, what is he to do until he gets in? How can he manage this pain until he can get some help with that? So what do we treat pain with? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it, dep it really depends on the type of pain, the cause of pain, the duration of pain. So there are some general uh, considerations that we can think about. So first and foremost, find out if there's a non-drug treatment to help treat that pain. Often there are other things that you can do. You can do ice uh, for certain injuries, you can do heat for other injuries, um, even things that you wouldn't expect. So even though you're in pain with osteoarthritis, which is one of the most common reasons for pain in older adults, and let's remember osteoarthritis is a breakdown of the cartilage in the joint space, which when those joints um, lose that cartilage, it loses that cushion, and so the joints tend to rub together and cause pain because it's almost a bone-on-bone -bone type of situation. When that happens, weight loss and exercise, non-weight-bearing exercise, is actually very important to the management of the pain related to that osteoarthritis. If you look at the guidelines for how to manage osteoarthritis, they actually describe the very first prescription your doctor should be writing is non-drug treatments of exercise and weight loss. So what if we need to treat with a medication? What if we have done the exercise, we've implemented the exercise, we've implemented the weight loss, and we're seeing some results, but there's still some pain that exists? Well, some pain medicines are preferred in older adults because of the um, complications uh, that happen as we age and some of the um, 
uh, chronic illnesses that individuals have as they age, there are some medicines that are actually going to be more problematic in terms of side effects and drug interactions than others. So if you look at the uh, American Geriatrics Society uh, guidelines on the management of mild to moderate musculoskeletal pain, the number one recommended treatment is acetaminophen, which is generic Tylenol. Acetaminophen is actually a very uh, effective pain management medication for osteoarthritis. The challenge with acetaminophen is that people typically don't take enough to effectively treat their pain. So if you look at the bottle, most of the bottles are 500 milligrams in terms of the tablet strength, and most people take one pill every now and then. But in order to really effectively treat osteoarthritis pain, that acetaminophen needs to be dosed at 1,000 milligrams three times a day scheduled. There are some limits on sort of the dosing related to that, which I will describe as we move through this discussion, but I think it's very important to recognize that scheduling your pain medicines regularly throughout the day is very important. Pain is one of those things that if you get behind it, in other words, if you're in pain, it's very hard to treat. But if you get ahead of the pain, meaning you're predicting when the pain is going to be there and you're treating it effectively with medicines or other treatments before you're going to have ex extremely uh, high amounts of pain, it's going to be more effectively treated. There is a maximum dosing limit for acetaminophen. We don't want to exceed 3,000 milligrams per day. And the reason for that is over 3,000 milligrams per day is, is um, sort of the, the the limit that the Food and Drug Administration has placed on acetaminophen because when it's combined with other acetaminophen products, which we'll talk about how that can happen, um, or when if somebody uh, drinks alcohol, then that is um, something that can affect your liver in a very negative way. So we'll talk about that as we, as we move forward. So some considerations with acetaminophen. It will treat pain, and actually it will treat fever uh, very effectively. It does not treat inflammation. So that's another important uh, thing to remember. If you have an acute injury that has an inflammatory component, acetaminophen can help with the pain portion, but it will not help with the uh, inflammation portion. As I mentioned for the dosing, take it scheduled and take it consistently. Um, do not exceed the maximum amount per day because of the potential for uh, damaging the liver. And the reason that this was restricted down to the 3,000 milligrams, it used to be 4,000 milligrams, but the challenge was that there were so many products that contained acetaminophen that people didn't realize they were taking in conjunction with their over-the-counter acetaminophen, that they were getting excessive amounts of acetaminophen, and that was causing liver damage. Um, so other pain medicines like hydrocodone is often combined with acetaminophen as well as oxycodone. Some over-the-counter medicines for cough and cold preparation sometimes contain acetaminophen. Even Excedrin over-the-counter contains some acetaminophen. So it's important to read those labels and know if you're taking acetaminophen, perfectly safe at the dosages that I recommended, which were with 1,000 milligrams three times a day. But if you look and you see that you're taking other acetaminophen, you need to really make sure you don't reach or exceed that 3,000 milligrams per day mark. Some other considerations. It's generally well tolerated, but I mentioned that it is uh, potentially problematic for individuals who drink alcohol. And the reason is that alcohol can affect the liver in a negative way and can damage the liver, and that increases the risk of the acetaminophen also causing that damage to the liver. Um, it's unlikely uh, to be a problem with other illnesses, meaning that acetaminophen doesn't have a lot of interactions with other diseases, which you'll see some of the other medications that we're going to talk about later could potentially have interactions with chronic diseases that many older adults um, have in conjunction with their pain. Very few drug interactions, although there's a possible interaction with uh, the medication warfarin, which is a blood thinner used for people with atrial fibrillation or other conditions that put them at risk for developing a clot. So we know that there are other pain medicines available over the counter, and the most common class of medicines that you'll see are what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. These are often abbreviated as NSAIDs or NSAID type medications. Medicines of this type will treat the pain and they will treat fever as well as inflammation. So there are some uh, advantages with using these medications. But unfortunately, they also have very strong effects on the stomach. Acetaminophen does not have any effects on the stomach at all, whereas these type of medicines have um, uh, 
the risk of um, eventually, if you use them long enough or in high enough doses, that there's high potential for developing a gastric ulcer, a stomach ulcer, and then bleeding, of course, from that ulcer is a very big concern. Um, so gastric ulcer is a very large concern with the use of NSAIDs in older adults, and that risk is highest for older adults in terms of the development and risk for developing that ulcer. Let's talk a bit more about NSAIDs. What type of products are we really talking about here? Well, there are three main types of NSAIDs that we talk about. There's naproxen, which is generic for Aleve. There is ibuprofen, which is, which is generic for Advil or Motrin. And then there is aspirin. So the first two, naproxen and ibuprofen, are commonly used for inflammation and pain and often for fever as well. Aspirin, on the other hand, is really not recommended for pain. Um, it has too many side effects, and in the high doses necessary to achieve anti-inflammatory and pain effects, we have uh, naproxen and ibuprofen, which tend to be much more effective for the treatment of pain and inflammation than aspirin itself is. So aspirin tends to be a little bit harsher on the stomach, tends to be um, higher in terms of the risk of side effects than the other two medications, and so we don't generally recommend aspirin for that purpose. Now, aspirin does have a very important role in um, preventing heart attacks because it has strong effects on the platelet which then prevent those platelets from sticking together and causing different types of uh, plaque formulations and clots in the heart and other places. So it is important um, for those that have cardiac conditions to continue their aspirin. But it's also important to recognize if you're taking aspirin and then you take an NSAID, your risk of a gastric ulcer increases um, significantly. There are many generic formulations of these medicines, and so I mentioned just the naproxen and ibuprofen as a generic because you know, there really are Safeway brands or different brands um, at your local pharmacy or, or grocery store that um, are generic and, and contain this product, so it's important to read the label to know, um, you know which of these products you're taking. So what are some NSAID considerations? Um, generally, the prescription, we have these both available over the counter and by prescription. The prescription doses tend to be um, anywhere from two to four times more potent or you know, higher strength than those over the counter. And the prescription doses tend to be the doses that we target for the anti-inflammatory effects. So ibuprofen over the counter is going to be 200 milligrams available um, from the pharmacy or from the, gr the grocery store wherever you purchase your ibuprofen. Um, but if you buy it prescription, you actually have it in a 400, 600, or 800 milligram strength. And it's really as you approach that 800 milligrams um, three times a day that you're going to see the, the strongest anti-inflammatory effects. But as I mentioned, the higher the dose you go that you get, the more risk of developing some of those stomach side effects as well as, well as other side effects. So I think it's very important to recognize while it's very effective. Probably these uh, medications should be reserved for the short term and only during an acute injury where there's an inflammatory component. And generally, I recommend that you, can, you have a conversation with your provider about using this medicine um, because they should be involved to make sure there aren't other drug or drug disease interactions with the NSAID class of medicines. Naproxen's dosing is uh, usually 250 to 500 twice a day. Um, you can get it over the counter in a salt formulation of 220 milligrams that can be taken up to three times a day potentially. But generally, I recommend 250 to 500 twice a day. I always recommend that you take these medications with food. And the reason is because taken without food can really um, cause some significant stomach upset and nausea, which leads me to my next um, slide to talk about some of the side effects with these NSAID medications. I've mentioned several, but I think it's really worthy to talk more about that. So I mentioned the stomach upset and the fact that it's important to take nonsteroidals with food to decrease that risk. Um, one of the reasons that it causes stomach upset and then eventually if you use it long enough or in high enough doses could affect um, the, the development of a gastric ulcer is the fact that these medicines will increase stomach acid and reduce the stomach lining protection. So that combination, increasing the acid, reducing the protection, means that that acid is really affecting that lining of the stomach and breaking it down. And when it breaks down, then that acid is sort of eating away at that um, stomach layer and then that obviously can go deep enough that there can be blood that comes out and then that's a bleeding ulcer. So again, short term, lower doses, um, even up to higher doses short term, probably okay, but because the risk of the long term effects of these NSAIDs is very, very strong on the stomach, the American Geriatric Society does not recommend them as a first line treatment. 
It can affect the kidneys, especially in older adults. Um, so that's something else to think about. If you have kidney disease, this is not a recommended medicine for you. It can increase blood pressure, again, partially because of the effects that it has on the kidneys. Um, and some of the medicines that we use for blood pressure may not work as well as a result of that effect. Uh, it can cause sodium and fluid uh, retention, which is a concern for those with heart failure or other conditions where they may have some fluid retention. What about the drug interactions with the nonsteroidals? There is a warfarin interaction. It's not that it's going to increase the levels of the warfarin, but rather it can increase the risk of developing a bleed from taking warfarin and nonsteroidals. And that's partially because of the stomach that we talked about and the, the risk there, but also because the nonsteroidals, like aspirin, although much weaker in this, in this way than aspirin, can affect platelets. So if you're affecting the platelets and you're, you're decreasing how well they work, that means your risk of bleeding can increase. Warfarin also is a medicine that reduces the risk of clot by, um, um, th people think of it as a blood thinner, but it reduces the risk of clot, and so that combination can increase your risk of bleeding. A medicine for bipolar disorder, lithium, the levels of that uh, lithium medication can be increased by using nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And I mentioned already some of the blood pressure medicines don't work as well in combination with NSAIDs, and that's um, in particular true for the diuretic type medicines. Some depression medicines, especially the SSRI type, can be a problem. This includes sertraline, paroxetine, and citalopram because those medicines also inhibit platelets. So again, combined, you have that increased risk of developing some bleeding. So those are some considerations for the drug interactions with nonsteroidals. Let's get back to TC. So remember, TC is the 70-year-old uh, male with a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, mild heart failure, high cholesterol. Notice that his knees are stiff in the morning and he wants to get something sort of to get going. So what options are appropriate in this situation? Considering everything we've talked about, the fact that this patient has uh, mild heart failure, has high blood pressure, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug is probably not going to be a good choice for them. So my recommendation for TC in this situation would be to use acetaminophen, one gram, three times a day scheduled until he's able to get in to see his provider to see if maybe there's something else going on um, that his provider may recognize to help treat um, the pain. There are other options uh, potentially that the provider could recommend. So TC takes acetaminophen and is significantly better, but is still in pain. So he makes an appointment to talk to his doctor to discuss other options. Um, so what other options are available and what should TC ask about these options? So this is where we're gonna talk a bit more about the opioid medications. And we're gonna spend the bulk of the rest of our time together talking about this, this class of medicines. Um, and then we'll close with some final thoughts. So opioid medications have been used for centuries for pain control. Um, the grandfather of all opioid drugs is morphine, which was derived from the poppy plant. It's one of 20 different alkaloids in opium. So it was isolated and then used as a medication to treat pain. Opioids act on pain receptors in the brain called mu receptors, and opioids mimic the natural painkillers in the body. So everybody has natural pain relievers. Um, the situation is that those natural pain relievers obviously can't always override the pain function uh, or the pain experience that we're having. As a result, sometimes we can give medicines that act just like those uh, sort of similar types of um, compounds and can add additional pain relief. Obviously, we know there are risks with the opioid pain medications. Um, but before we talk about those risks, I wanna talk a bit more about the opioids. So opioid medicines work very well for those in pain. And I think it's really important to recognize people in pain rarely, if ever, develop an addiction to pain medicines. Now, addiction is not the same as um, you know, sort of a physical dependence on the medicine where um, you, know, you develop a tolerance and you might need more of that medicine. Addiction is drug-seeking behavior for the purposes of getting high on the medicine as opposed to needing the medicine for functionality and having a high tolerance or threshold because of chronic use of that medicine and the body physically being dependent on that medicine as opposed to you seeking it so you can have a euphoric experience with that medicine. Very, very, very rare for people in pain to develop a true addiction where they're drug seeking for the purposes of just taking that medicine for recreational use. 
Now, others that are drug seeking can abuse pain medications, but generally the diversion occurs not from those using pain medicines to treat pain for appropriate use, use, uh, reasons or uses, but it's usually diversion from those um, that are not in pain necessarily or, or, or are using it for um, um, you know, nefarious reasons. So it's important to recognize that that's an, a common misconception um, with the use of opioids. Most people do not become, quote, addicted to opioid medicines. Now, opioid medications have many types and many formulations. There are short-acting uh, medications for short-term or breakthrough pain. There are long-acting medicines for more chronic pain. Again, you want the duration to be very long during the day so that you've got um, a long, um, you know, uh, con a lot of a long concentration of those medicines in your body throughout the day. And sometimes they're used together. So you may take a, a chronic. Uh, a long-acting medicine for chronic pain in the morning and then you may recognize that you're having some extra pain during that time and you can take a short-acting medicine to sort of help with that breakthrough situation or if you're um, exercising or trying to get through rehabilitation maybe that's a time to take that short-acting um, medicine right before that experience so that you're able to um, get through that more effectively so they are used together um, on occasion. So because of the abuse potential, because of those that are not using it for pain treatment but are using it for other purposes, there are many restrictions on the use of opioids. So I think it's important to talk a bit about some of those restrictions because it might explain why um, some of the providers are more challenged in prescribing this type of medication. So there are actually special prescription paper rules. So um, you actually have to write these uh, prescriptions for opioid medicines on a special type of paper that has some security checks within it so that people can't forge the medicines uh, or forge the prescriptions rather. And then there are rules around the use of opioid medications as well. So some can't be refilled as all, at all. Some um, are not uh, available for refill at all at, at your pharmacy. Um, some have only up to five refills maximum over a certain time period. And then there have been recent restrictions on hydrocodone. So used to be hydrocodone contain, containing products, you could actually get refills at the pharmacy on those products. And in November, the FDA actually reclassified that medicine as what's called Schedule II, which is the um, highest schedule prescription drug uh, available. And that means that that particular medicine can no longer be refilled at the pharmacy. You need a fresh prescription each time you need a refill. I also think it's very, very important to recognize that even though we have the best intentions in mind, it is illegal to share pain medicines with other people. So if you have a friend who experiences a pain situation, you have hydrocodone or oxycodone or a pain medicine at home and you offer that to that individual and um, you know something happens to that person, you are liable for that and potentially that is considered um, you know, criminal in a way. So it's very important to be um, very sure you don't share those medicines. It is not legal to do so and it could uh, prevent or provide some um, challenges for you. So what are some other opioid considerations? Well, we mentioned they work very well for pain if they're used properly. So how do you, quote, use them properly? What are some things to think about? The first step is to start with an appropriate dose. And generally in older adults, I recommend a lower dose because sometimes people are more sensitive to the effects of opioids, which we'll talk about the side effects and why that's important. So start with a lower dose. Increase as directed by the doctor. So if you're feeling like that lower dose isn't working, rather than you sort of trying to guess how much you, you should increase your pain medicine, it's really important to communicate that back to your prescriber so that they're aware, oh, it's not working, let's try a, a, a higher dose or let's try a different agent. It's important to stop using that medicine when the pain is no longer present. So that's a, a difficult challenge sometimes. Often people will stop before they're ready and they'll still be in pain. And some people will continue it because they're so concerned they're, that that pain is going to come back. So that's another thing to think about is when is it appropriate to stop using. It's always appropriate to ask your provider, when can I start tapering myself off of this medicine? And it may be that if you're in chronic pain, it may be that you can't taper off that medicine. And this is something you're going to be taking for, for the long term. But too often, I think this is true for any medication, whether it's an opioid, an NSAID, acetaminophen, or something for um, the symptomatic relief of urinary incontinence, we never go back and say, is this medicine still needed? And I think it's a very important question to ask. Can we decrease the dose? Has that pain episode um, gotten better? Has the, the cause of that pain improved? Um, so those are all considerations to think about. How can we sort of 
start that process of, of um, weaning ourselves off those pain medications. Um, so again, I mentioned you can use short and long acting medicines for chronic pain. Some medicines require a tolerance before they're prescribed, and what I mean by that is it's really not appropriate to use the medicines until the person has been on pain medicines of the opioid type for a certain duration and at a certain dose. And those are oxycontin and duragesic. So that's uh, oxycontin is a long-acting form of uh, oxycodone, and duragesic is a um, patch formulation of the drug fentanyl that, can, that provides a continuous um, amount of that medicine. The reason I say you really should not develop a tolerance for some of those longer acting medicines is that if you don't and you take it, it's one of those drugs that can cause significant side effects, dangerous side effects in those that are not used to taking opioid medicines. So um, you really shouldn't be using those medicines as the first line. It's usually much further down the road once we've developed a tolerance to some of the other opioid medicines. What are the side effects that you might experience with opioids? Why are we concerned? Why am I spending so much time on the opioids? Well, there are central side effects, central being in the brain, so to speak, because these primarily act by working on the brain receptors. So they have the uh, effect to cause sedation. You'll feel sleepy when you take the medications. There's a potential for euphoria if you get too much of the medicines. There's a risk of fall. Um, because it may affect your balance and again your, your, your cognition may be slowed or you may have some confusion if you get too much of these medicines. There are respiratory effects. So actually um, the, the most dangerous thing about opioid uh, overdose is the risk of affecting the respiratory centers. And that means, you know, naturally we don't think about breathing, we're not conscious about it, but the um, receptors are affected, the respiratory receptors are affected by the opioid medicines. And in uh, cases of overdose, they can really affect the breathing receptors and therefore as a result, decrease the breathing to the point that you're not able to breathe anymore on your own. Um, it can have a concern in those with lung disease as a result, asthma or extreme COPD, um, but we do see these medicines used with those conditions because again, if somebody's in pain, we want to treat them. We just want to follow them a little bit more carefully. There are GI effects. So this is another medicine that can cause nausea where if you use the medicine and take some food first, you actually can decrease the risk of that nausea. And probably one of the most um, challenging side effects with this medicine is constipation. So older adults are already independently at risk for developing constipation, and when taking this medicine, that risk increases significantly. And I'll talk a bit about what you can do to prevent that constipation and then also treat that constipation. So um, opioid considerations, some medicines of the opioid class are not appropriate for older adults. And the two that I can think about, one is Demerol or Meperidine. I don't think there's any um, reason why an older adult would need to use this medicine. It tends to have a long-acting metabolite that accumulates and ca can cause um, seizures potentially. So this is a medicine that's just not recommended for older adults, especially because that accumulation can occur because the kidneys aren't working as well as we age and that um, metabolite is cleared by the kidneys, so it increases even more so in older adults. We have lots of better opioid medicines than Demerol that are out there. Methadone can be used in older adults, but it really should be used under the um, sort of uh, care of a pain specialist. And the reason is because it's very long acting. It can affect um, you know, the, the heart rhythm and it has lots of drug interactions. And so this is a medicine that we do use for chronic pain, but again, you'd want to uh, be followed by a pain specialist in that situation. Codeine tends to be a bit of a weaker uh, opioid, so it's not that it's you know, completely inappropriate. In fact, codeine is the prodrug of morphine, so it's very related to morphine, it's just a weaker formulation. Tends to have more GI side effects, so more nausea, more constipation risk, and tends to be a bit weaker. Um, probably you're going to see more prescriptions of Tylenol with codeine prescribed because it's still Schedule three, meaning you can do refills. It doesn't have the same restrictions as the hydrocodone, which is what most people were using um, for, for sort of short duration, uh, short acting pain relief. And now I, I have a feeling we're going to see more codeine. Um, so if that medicine is used, it's fine, but it should be considered a little bit of a weaker opioid with potential for more GI side effects. So again, use with caution if an opioid is combined with acetaminophen and you're already taking acetaminophen. Now, perfectly acceptable to use this medicine um, as an opioid medicine combined with acetaminophen. There's no drug interaction there potentially, but if you're then taking acetaminophen and other products, that can lead you toward that 3,000 uh, milligram limit where you're, you're putting yourself at risk for developing liver toxicity. 
mentioned to take with food to reduce nausea. I also recommend you drink plenty of fluids while you're on this to sort of reduce the risk of constipation. But if that constipation develops, a lot of people use opioids with stool softener, and that really um, has never been shown to be an effective way to treat constipation. And in particular, it's not been shown to be effective to treat constipation related to opioid use. So we really need to use a stimulant laxative if constipation develops. The reason is the mu receptors that I mentioned, some of those same receptors that the opioids affect are in the gut, and they slow the gut down, meaning that the food and, and you know, all the digestive food is sitting in the bowel and not moving anywhere. So if you then give a stool softener, you potentially, which they don't work very well, but if they did work, you'd have a bunch of soft stool sitting there, which isn't gonna do anything. You really need to stimulate the bowel to move. That's why we need a stimulant laxative. An example of that might be Senna or Senecot or bisacodyl, which is also known as Dolcolax. Those are examples of stimulant laxatives. Otherwise, um, that constipation can be really severe and debilitating. So let's talk, now that we've talked about the opioids, a bit more um, to close um, with the pain considerations. One of the things I think is very important is keep a symptom diary. Find out what, what type of pain um, is helped by the medicine. Um, what's your pain score after the medicine? What other activities make the pain better? What activities make the pain worse? If you can use a non-drug treatment, please try to do so. If a non-drug treatment works, great. Um, if you do need to use a medication, recognize all medicines are going to have potential for side effects. But um, we recommend, the American Geriatric Society recommends, starting with acetaminophen. If that doesn't work, you can, you can consider other agents, but really it should be a discussion with your provider. Um, for short durations, potentially NSAIDs could help, um, but again, there are risks that, that we've discussed. And then opioids, and we've discussed some of the risks and some of the benefits of the opioid use and opioid-type medicines. Um, so those are all things to think about. So starting with non-drug, moving to potentially acetaminophen, and then um, having conversation with your provider about other options that are available to you. So closing thoughts. Uh, keep an updated list of medicines to share with providers. I've talked already about, and I haven't directly addressed the fact, that if you are taking medicines over the counter, then they could have interactions or potential effects on both your disease um, as well as on other medicines that you're taking. And if you're doing that without letting your pharmacist or your physician know, then there is potential for that to become serious. Again, chances are these medicines are gonna be fine, but if you communicate it, then you can be assured that those medicines are fine. And if they're not, no problem. You can change the use of those medications. So keep that updated list. And when I say updated list, I mean herbal products, dietary supplements, over-the-counter medicines, and prescription medicines. Those are all considered drugs. So really make sure that you're communicating that list to all of your providers. Secure all pain medicines and dispose of unused medicines. Don't allow others to potentially um, use some of your pain medications for, uh, for inappropriate reasons. Caregivers, family members potentially could abuse some of the medicines that you're using for the right reasons. So really secure those medicines and don't stockpile them for the rainy day. If you're no longer in pain, no longer needing those medicines, destroy those medicines. Take them to um, the police. Sometimes the police stations will have special days um, where and you can call the police station and ask them where, where, where they will collect those pain medicines from you. The DEA also has their drug take back day where they'll have buckets and bins where you can come to a central location at a grocery store or someplace and actually drop off um, you know, your pain medications so that others don't have access to them. So what if you're unable to get those medicines to the police department or the, the drug take back or you're concerned that there may be some um, diversion occurring with your pain medicines, what can you do? Don't, don't flush those medicines down the toilet. That's not a recommended uh, way to dispose of them because they actually can get in the water supply and it's, it's not appropriate to do so. The recommendation at this point is to take those medicines and pour them out of the bottle into a sack filled with kitty litter or potentially coffee, you know, used coffee grounds, destroy them in some way, add some water to it, zip it up and throw it in the trash. So that is the recommended way at this point we have um, if you cannot get rid of them by giving them to the police to destroy or the DEA. Some pharmacies may be willing, but there is no obligation for that pharmacy to take that medicine back. Some pharmacies may be willing to take those medicines back, but you need to communicate with them before assuming that that 
is going to happen. So please don't stockpile. Just get, let's get the, the medicine um, you know, out of the household if you're not using it anymore. So just to recap, pain is not a normal part of aging and the treatment of pain is very important to your health. I hope that during this uh, conversation, you have uh, learned a bit about sort of the first level of pain treatment for mild to moderate pain, and the second level, potentially talking to your provider, some of the risks with using me medicines, how you can use them more appropriately, and uh, considerations to think about when you do start a medicine for the treatment of pain. And I have enjoyed my time here. I hope you have as well. I have some references here for you, should you like to read more about um, either pain uh, treatment in older adults. There's a great resource um, called geriatricpain.org, which is actually funded by the Mayday Fund, which has um, funded tremendous different um, organizations and research related to geriatrics pain. And then there's also the AGS position statement on mild to moderate pain, which I've included here for your reference as well, should you want to read a bit about that. Again, thank you for your time, and I hope you uh, are pain-free or at least um, understand ways to treat your pain more effectively, and thank you.